We left off last week, or on page Peches in the, the 19th chapter in the Maral, Kuras Hashem, where he went to explain that they had suspected Moshe, this is Klal Yisrael, that he had his own and their wives. I mean, how is it even possible to consider such a thing? So the Maral explained that Moshe Rabbeinu, being the equivalent of all Klal Yisrael, his dimension of spirituality, he encompassed and touched upon the spirituality of every Jew. And what's the most intimate aspect of a human being? His neshama, his soul. As a result of this, so what is his connection to them and to their wives? They believed that his connection was a physical connection. Somehow he was physically, physically connected. So if he's physically connected, it's a problem. Because that means, chas v'sholem, we're talking about adultery. So they suspected Moshe that he had some kind of interest in the physicality, which of course was considered sinful on their part. So he explained over here, he said something phenomenal, concept. Peches, uh, the first column, and right in the middle he says, Every human being based on his makeup, he has a mate which is appropriate for him. God created each human being that is a mate which is compatible with his essence. So, but who's compatible with Moshe? The wife of every man. This is the lowliest of the lowliest. There's no greater deficiency or lowliness than to think for a moment that a man is compatible with somebody else's wife. That he has no appropriate mate only the maid of every other man. If that's the case, this level of attachment doesn't exist within existence. Because the way God created existence, a maid is only the one who's meant for you. But if every person has his own mate who's compatible with him, how is it possible that Moshe has relevance to everybody's mate? But again, what was their issue? Because they misunderstood Moshe. They, their evaluation and standing was Moshe that he had relevance to the physical existence. They didn't realize that he has no relevance to physicality whatsoever. And it's purely the souls, the neshamos of Klal Yisrael. He encompasses the totality of the spirituality. No relevance. They suspected him, God forbid, that he will commit adultery. Now look, Person, God forbid, commits adultery. It's a level of attachment which is inappropriate and not relevant to that person. Why? He's attaching himself to something which is not rightfully his. The Gemara tells us that whatever you place in existence is, even in terms of opportunity, financial, material. Even the lowly water carrier, he's meant to be that because God wants to be the water carrier. No one crosses, any, nobody infringes on anybody else. Wherever you are, that's what you're meant to be. So if a person, God forbid, steals or tries to undermine another person's position, what are, you're taking something, you're trying to attach yourself to something which is not really within creation. Why is it not within creation? Because you're not meant to attach yourself to something. Because God says, it's not only the wife is compatible, even your possessions are only compatible with the owner. So what's so terrible about stealing? 
you've crossed the line. What's meant to be yours is yours. What's meant to be his is his. So taking something, and that's why it's interesting. Gore tells us that a judge who's corrupted and he offers uh, a corrupted verdict, he deserves to have his soul taken. But a judge who rules truthfully and, cor and correct, he's God's partner in creation. More in Sanhedrin. Where do we know this from? Because it says by Moshe Rabbeinu, when he adjudicated all the disputes, it says he sat from morning till evening. It says Boker, it says Erev. So just as in the beginning of creation, time of creation, it's by Erev, by Boker, it was evening, it was morning, which is creation. So the judge, Moshe Rabbeinu, was the ultimate judge in terms of justice, it says Boker and Erev. So we find Boker and Erev mentioned morning and evening mentioned by Moshe. So if you're on that parallel, you're God's partner in creation. Therefore, Adon, Din, Emes, Labito, a judge who judges, offers a verdict which is truth, truthfully just, he's God's part in creation. But if one who does not, he deserves to have his soul taken. And not only that, he's, he's, he's inconveniencing God that to compensate the money that was taken illegally to give it back to its rightful owner. Now the question is, so, is it so difficult for God? No, that's not it. God created the world within a context of order, what we call teva. There's a natural order. Order means what's meant to be A's is A's, what's meant to be B's is B's. So if the judge goes and corrupts the order, he's corrupting creation. He's undermining creation. But what about if the judge, he sets the record straight? What's meant to be A's is A's, what's meant to be B's is B's. That's order. What is order? Order means that's creation. So therefore, he's God's partner in creation. The judge who sets the record and causes what's rightfully yours to be yours. But the same thing on every level. There's a, there's a provision, a Jew's not permitted to crossbreed species. Torah violation. Why? Because God, when he created creation, it says by time of creation, it says, let me know, according to its species. I mean, there's an order in creation. To take two species and crossbreed them, even within agriculture, it's a Torah violation. You're not permitted. Because what are you doing? It's, it's a disruption of order. He says you cannot have chibur. It cannot have any relevance to good once you go and you cross that line. What's meant to be, so he says, but what's the ultimate level of destruction to believe something is an attachment where there's no attach there is no basis for attachment, such as adultery. If that man's wife is compatible with him because you have an interest, God forbid, in that woman, and that person engages with her, the t attachment is, is, is not is an artificial attachment. It has no relevance. It's like God forbid a person goes and commits bestiality. He does a sexual act with an animal. What relevance does the man it's called bestiality? Even though it's with a human being, adultery, God forbid, but it's no different. You have no relevance to that person. Because that woman is compatible with a different man. There can't be a keyboard. There can't be any degree of unity in that. It cannot be unified. So this is what they suspect the Moshe Rabbeinu of. Moshe's attachment to the wives is an attachment with every man's wife, which is an impossibility. It's inappropriate on, on the most extreme level. So you can imagine the way they, they visualize Moshe Rabbeinu. He Moshe nichtas b'gvul shelohem. Moshe entered into that boundary. Mashein roi l'shubriyo shel yielu chibur al zuloso. No cr creature has any relevance outside of its own species. Every species, living species, naturally procreates only with its own species. One species does not procreate with another species. Only a human being, God forbid, through, because he has the ability to make decisions, which is what we call free choice, he could do something unnatural. An animal cannot do something unnatural. 
an, an animal instinctively. So what does instinct reveal? That's nature. That's the nature. It's part of the DNA, which is part of the instinct of this particular species. For instance, the Mori tells us that a species which procreates during the nighttime period always gives birth in, nighttime, in, in the evening, in nighttime period. There are certain species that only procreate only during daytime. They will always give birth only during the daytime. But a human being who could, could procreate day or night, that's why a human could be born either during the day or nighttime period. So it's to that degree. What happened at the time of the Mabel, time of the Great Flood? Species began procreating with other species. The whole nature became corrupted. The whole reality of existence was a different reality. God that didn't create this existence. Man, through his corrupt behavior, had putrefied existence to such a point, the world didn't function within the context of God's order. God said, this is not the world I created. If this is not the world I created, it's over. I'm ending it. It says, Vayimach es kol He obliterated. Whatever existed, it dissolved. The water was sulfuric. Sulfuric water, hot water. The only species that went into the ark were what? Pure species. Of course, the sp pure species represented the original order that God created. But anything that was corrupted did not make it through the ark. And it was miraculous. All, the only species that could come through that door of the ark was a pure species. Otherwise, it was rejected. It cannot go through that door. Because again, that's what we call Seder. It's interesting. There's a negative commandment that a Jew is not permitted to add to the Torah or detract from the Torah or subtract from the Torah. Either it's lo Yosef or lo Yigra. We call bal Tosef, bal Tigra. You're not permitted to add or detract. Why not? So the Chinuch writes, who's a codifier, explains something that's perfect. Mm -hmm. Truly perfect. Torah Sashem Tamimo. David says the Torah is perfect. So you can say, look, if let's say something works exceptionally and it has a thousand components. Say if it has a thousand components, you can imagine how much better work if it has a thousand and one. Mm. No, that throws it off kilter. It will no longer function. A person that has two hands, so if he has three hands, what is it? It's an abnormality. It's not more is better. The Gemara says, Kolamosiv Gorea. When you add, you're detracting. Shlemus, creation is teva. Order is perfect. God's order is a perfect order. Man's order may not be perfect. Or God or set in order, that's perfect. We have to function within that order. So if man goes and corrupts that order, so the Torah says, Hashem says, I gave you a perfect Torah. Well, I, I feel 613 is too much, 612. I'll live within 612. But that's not the Torah. The Torah 613. What about 614? Again, that's not, that's not my order. It's a different order. That's your order. It's not my order. Therefore, you're in violation. Because the Torah only generates and spiritualizes. And you can only have a relationship with God only if you work within His system. His system is 613. Not 612, not 614. It's, it's the same idea. That's within the spiritual context. We have within the physical context, within the spiritual context. There's a word from a kind of that says something phenomenal. You know, very often, uh, terminology, if it's misunderstood, it can be, it's, it's not good. For instance, saying the Shema, which is a Torah obligation, Jew has to declare his belief within the context of the, the text of the Torah. Shema Yisrael Hashem Elkein Hashem Echod that is the declaration of every Jew we declare our belief in the unity of, of God okay what is Kriya Shema referred to Kabolas O Malchus Shemayim Accepting upon yourself the yoke of heaven. Jew is new to Judaism, so you know. It's important for you to accept the yoke of heaven. 
He has the word yoke. He's, he's, he's going the other way. Sounds, it's like burden. You mean you want to burden me? You mean God wants to burden me? If it's a burden, could you imagine? The person says, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open an account for you and you can withdraw whenever you want. You have three tons of gold bullion and another 20 tons of silver bullion. No, be loaded up on the truck, just take it. it. Sounds too much, too heavy. But if you see the value, not too much. The more the better, so to say. But it's even better than that. What is a yoke? What is a yoke? A yoke, you put a yoke on an ox, on an animal, when it plows. What is a plow? A plow is a blade that goes into the ground and you hitch the plow to an ox. The ox, if the ox walks in a straight line, the blade tears up the ground. And that's how, that's how you plow. What happens if the ox doesn't walk a straight line and it goes off to the right or to the left? You know what happens to that blade? It breaks in the ground. You no longer have the blade in the ground. So what's key and crucial? The ox should not be able to turn his, its head as much as an iota. So when you put the yoke on the head of the ox and you put the pins on both sides, its head is locked, it only sees a straight line. As a result of seeing a straight line, it plows perfectly and the blade doesn't break. That's the value. So yoke doesn't mean you're burdening the ox. To cause the ox to see correctly, straight, and not to be distracted, because any distraction destroys the, breaks the blade. It, you have to accept the yoke of heaven that your perception you have tunnel vision but this tunnel vision is seeing it all S straight as an arrow you don't see to the right there's no distortion you see it exactly as it is but when is that? if you understand who God is and you revere God sufficiently nothing else has importance other than him then you see it straight you know, the Chavetz Chaim brings a, an allegory to explain it. There was this person, and um, he was an orphan, sick, malnourished, dirty, diseased, sores on its, his body, and he was lying in the mud. The king, one of the greatest kings, passes by, and he sees this beautiful child literally on the brink of death so he summons one of his people and says I want you to take that child out bring him to my palace I want him cleaned up get us the best, best, best medical care I want him cured as long as it takes whatever it takes after maybe a year the child is fully cured he says now I want you to start educating him and teaching him and whatever he needs provide and then he has his tailor come. He tailors garments for him like he's a prince. This orphan child, this is what the king is providing for this child. Evidently, he sees something special about this child. And then he says, this child will be my right-hand person. And the honor that you must accord him is similar to my honor. Because he's the equivalent of my special child. And when you fashion his garments, I want them studded with precious gems, stones. And also he will wear a crown. And the greatest ministers of my kingdom will prostrate themselves before him. Okay? It's unbelievable. You know what this king gave to this child? It's unimaginable. Beyond. Okay? All of a sudden, and this is going on, and he's mentoring him, he gives him honor, reverence, opportunity, power, value, that you can, it's, it's unimaginable. Now the child is, is traveling with his father in the royal coach and he sees kids playing in the mud and it brings back memories. He jumps out of the coach, jumps with his real garments into the mud, into the squalor. The king looks at him and says, he's insane. I t this is where he came from. 
He was dying, diseased, ill, knew nothing. Putting a crown on his hand is, is, is an understatement what I did for him. Now he's jumping right back into the squalor, into the filth, into what is he giving up for what? The world's at his, at his, at his beck and call. Goes into the mud. So the Chavetz Chaim writes, what happened at Sinai? God took us as his kingly, priestly nation. The angels tremble in the presence of the Jewish soul. The angels cannot say Kedusha until the Jew says Kedusha first. They wait for us to say Kedusha. We are the prized child of Hashem. You're my God's children. So what do we do? Hedonism, materialism. God, we're not interested. We want to be on the golf course. We want to be in the whatever it is. Go out to who knows where. I mean, giving all that up. Here you have unless, unlimited numbers of angels singing your praises because you're God's child. And we you going back into the mud? You're behaving and living like a physical being, like, like an intellectual animal. Hashem says, could you imagine how enraged a father would be if this is the way his child behaves? Baruch Hashem, this means a But that's the, that's the reality. So what was Moshe's dimension? Moshe's dimension had no relevance to the material. It was purely spiritual. So how did they... Moshe radiates. When he came down after, after the, the Chet Egel, he radiated, they couldn't look at his holiness. Could you imagine? We suspect him. God forbid. He even committed adultery. Chas This is This is... This is... Uh, I mean, the word of, of, of insanity is, 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 is not a word to be used. I mean, it's... We can't even relate to this. They say, we understand what you're saying, but fa factually, it seems to be. We can't reconcile the two, but that seems to be. They misjudged him. But it was sinful. Now we add something. An attachment which is not appropriate or meant for you that reveals of the level of deficiency and lack of quality within that person. You think Moshe is holy? You know, it's interesting. The mission of Pirkei Avos speaks about the students of Bilam and the students of Avraham Avinu. It speaks about their characteristics. Pompous Bilam students. Unsatiable need for material egos, swollen egos and students of Avram humble everything just to the contrary and they ask the question what do we have to uh, contrast the students of Bilam the students of Avram, let's contrast Bilam to Avram this is Avram, this is Bilam what do we have to speak about the students of each other so the answer which is given, if you look at what was Bilam, it says Lo kom nobi be Israel kemoshe. There's no prophet ever as great as Moshe be Israel, but among the nations of the world, there was a prophet, Bilam. If you look at Bilam, the man committed bestiality. The man was had megalomania. The man had an unsatiable need for material. Committed bestiality. Could you? But he was a prophet. If you look at Bilam, what did he look like? He looked like a Moshe Rabbeinu. He radiated holiness. But what was he? He was the lowest of the low. But how does it... It doesn't jive. See, see? You can radiate holiness, and you're not that. But it seems to me he is. He's a holy man. Unless you know, you don't know. You know how you know the difference? Look at what kind of students he produces. The students are not the prophets. He produces something which, are, which is... Disastrous. It's catastrophic for, for existence. And look what kind of students Avram produces. From the student, you, it reveals what the teacher is. Therefore, the mission in Perkei 
contrast the students of Avram to the students, Talmidi Avram to Talmidi Bilam, a Russia. Bilam a Russia. You only know Bilam's the Russia when you look at the students he produces. That, that, that's the proof of the pudding, as we say. So, if you have a Bilam, who's a Bilam, and he's a prophet, Moshe Rabbeinu, Chas Visholem, who knows? But would God have that relationship? The Torah was given to Moshe Rabbeinu. Torah Tzivilon of Moshe, Moshe Kilas Yaakov. He's the conduit. Bilam is the conduit for nothing. For what? For nothing. Only evil. What does a mate? A mate is a bone of your bone. So it's interesting. Today we have such advanced medicine. You have kidney transplants, heart transplants, all kinds of transplants. But factually, when any foreign element is attached to the body, there's rejection. The body rejects the heart, the kidney rejects it. Why? It's not compatible. That's why when a person that they do kidney transplants, there has to be a compatibility. Otherwise, it doesn't take. It doesn't take. So what do they have to do? Let's say with a heart, they have no choice. They don't look for compatible. They find the heart, the first one, but do you know how much medication has to be to suppress that there should not be rejection? You, you understand? We see from the physical to the spiritual. If it's not compatible, it's prisus. It's destructive. It's a deficiency. What did Adam say when he, he evaluated all the species and he saw, I have no mate? When he created Chava, which was made of an appendage of his, into a human being, he said, Etzem Eatzomai. There's a bone of my bone, there's the flesh of my flesh. This is me. This is compatible with me. That's the point he's making. Kamoshoma Zosapam Etzem Eatzomai. So God forbid one who takes a mate, another man's wife, this reveals of the essence of the evil of that person. Because there is no compatibility. You're attached to something which is not appropriate for you. There's nothing more evil and more deficient than this. Omnam Kozeb and they show you Omri Kimoshi Eshlo Shituf in Yisrael. Of course, he, he said he has a commonality with Klal Yisrael. Avo Bemis Moshe Lo Yushituf in Yisrael Rak Nivdo Man. Moshe Rabbeinu's essence was transcended, totally detached from Klal Yisrael. Kach Lo Yimet Starf Lem Klal. He had no attachment to them. Zeshoma Lo Chamor Echod Meim Nososi. When they started complaining, said that I even take a donkey from them. What's Chamor always? Chomer. The I have no relevance to the material. Nothing. I, I need nobody. Moshe was self-sufficient because of his relation with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He needs no one. There's no one on his, on his parallel. Pirishim HaYim Moshe Rabbeinu Olish Mishtati Flehem If he would have had any level of commonality with him HaYim Nosh Chamor I have a right to take the donkey because I'm, I'm, we're, we're on the same plane. Because there's a partnership. A partner takes a share based on the percentage of his partnership. Moshe Rabbeinu was not, was not what we call a shooter. He was not a partner. He doesn't need them. No, it's interesting. Shulmel says, Sonim Atonis Yechir. Mention this. The one who despises gifts will live. So, we, so the, one of the explanations is that the gift now if you want to have a relationship with, with Hashem which is the source of all life when you cleave to God why? If God is the source of everything so if you, the, the better you cleave the more relevant you have to life. Correct? Now, it, the more, the greater the commonality to, to God, the greater you could cleave. Is, is God ever a recipient of anything? 
God gives, God never receives. So if a person is agreeable to accept the gift, then this characteristic, this behavior, that you don't find by God. God never receives, only gives. Soni matonos yichia. If you truly want to li- live, you have to be a giver, not a taker. Even though the benefactor wants to give, it doesn't make a difference. You have to be a giver, not a taker. It's interesting. The Gemara tells us that when a man marries a woman, he has to give the value to the woman in marriage. If the woman gives the object of value to the husband, you are married to me with whatever she gives him. It's not valid. It's not a valid marriage. The husband must give something of value to the wife, and he marries her with what he gives her a value. So the Gemara speaks about a case. You have a person who's of a prestigious status, and the woman gives a gift to this, and this a person of, of princely prestige status doesn't take gifts from ordinary people. So for him to take a gift from anyone, it's a, it's a, a privilege for the one who gives the gift that the, that the prince or the, it is agreeable to accept the gift. So when he re- receives the gift, in fact, he's giving. So it says, Odom Chashuv, a person of prestigious status, he receives the gift from woman. He says, I am marrying you with the benefit that you receive when I receive the gift. The Kodesh, she's married. Because he's, he's taking his giving. So let's you have a case. Mark talks about a case. He had a very special Amora, special interpreter of the Mishnah. And he's invited to someone. But the reason why he accepts the invitation, he doesn't need the invitation. Because he wants to give that person value. He wants to give that person value. The, the receiving is only the means to give. That's not called receiving. That's called giving. So that he, so he said, the rabbi took. You know why he took? Because he wants to value the person. Give that person a sense that he values him. He's giving, he's not taking. So that's not contrary to spirituality. He said, I did not take a donkey from them. He, his profile has no relevance to what, what Claudius will are. We are still physical. We are needy. If the essence of your quantification is you are physical, so if you are physical, we are physical, of course our essence is spiritual, we have relevance, we receive, we, we need a physical to accommodate us. If he had any commonality with them, his Profile, his essence has relevance to the material. Why not? We're partners. I'm also a participant. A person who works doesn't get wages. Get wages. What about a person? He has no relevance to wages. Right? The angels came to Abraham. You know. Do they need food? The God's agents, the spiritual beings, they have no relevance. His quantification is classification he is profile is removed from physicality when the the, the, the Bichur tells us when the angels ate the food that Abraham Avinu offered it says they only went through the motions of eating the food did they need food an angel doesn't need food but to accommodate the hospitality of Abraham it appeared as if they ate it's something similar that's Moshe of course he ate Moshe only in, in heaven, but he has to eat. But the food is not has no relevance. He has no relevance to eating. He's only eating because he's on the terrestrial level, on, he's, because he happens to be on earth. In heaven, he didn't have to eat, because in truth, he's that spiritual person. Why should a person want to harm anyone else? What is because I have a need? I, I have an interest. Why is a person envious? Because what you have, I should have. But there's no such thing as what you have, I should have. You go before, you know, years ago, they had built in the Bronx Zoo a gorilla house. 
cost millions of dollars to build this. And it was a pavilion, guerrilla pavilion, a pavilion. And there was a certain person, not Jewish, and she sponsored it. And she invited people, who were mostly Jews, to um, if you give $10,000 to this a pavilion you're invited to this event to the opening inauguration of the uh, a pavilion okay so um, and if you come you give them to, they give you a Burberry bag you understand the bag costs $20 but if you give $10,000 they give you a $30, $40 bag but it's Burberry so this woman comes to me and she says to me you know she went to this event She's priding herself. And she even got a burp. I said, hey, are you, are you, did you take your medication today? <laughs> you gave $10,000 for a for an eighth pavilion. And you were invited. And you're priding yourself. You feel that you were valued. There must be something wrong with you. you. You sing it backwards. Again. And you notice, but you don't realize. You know the way they treat the there? Best medical care. They have the zoology department, which is one of a kind. The various zones for air conditioning and climate control. You think you're in the jungle. This is unbelievable. A level of sophistication you can't imagine. The quality of food, organic. There's no insecticides. Do you, can you imagine this? <coughs> Let me ask you a question. Are you envious of the ape? It couldn't care less the way the ape is accommodated. Are you envious of the ape? And what do I have to do with the ape? I'm a human being. That's an animal. But you realize it also works, walks on its hind legs. Right? Once at most times. And it also has a semblance of a human being. Is there any commonality between a human being and an ape? There is none. That was Moshe Rabbeinu even to Kalal Yisrael. He had no relevance to their essence. Their essence, yes. But to their physicality... He was fully removed. So to say he was envious, he had a need, he wanted nothing. I have no relevance to your whole existence in the physical sense. It's only, I have relevance to your spirituality, to your souls, to infuse your souls and to bring it to a higher level of perfection. But they misread him. They misread it. This is a cross the mind. It's like you understand human being, would you prefer to sleep in a homeless shelter or in the cage with the, with the ape, although they won't harm you? You're not an animal. Homeless shelter, at least, they're human beings. Not that you should be given that kind of choice. This all reveals. Moshe had no common ground in the material sense with Klal Yisrael. They actually think of harm one another. You know? Man is not perfect. We make mistakes. Gemara says, interesting, there's a discussion, the vestments that the Kohen officiated, the vestments, they were holy. So we know that something which is consecrated, you're not permitted to benefit. So there's a question the moment the coin finishes officiating, if he wears those vestments a moment longer, he's in violation because he's benefiting. He's wearing them. He should take it off instantaneously. So the Gemara says, the Talmud says, Lord, need the Torah l'malchei asharis. We're not angels. A human being, it's impossible. So therefore, in this context, if he wears it longer, it's okay. Because it's an impossibility. Man is not perfect. So man, if we're not perfect, we talk about there is envy to some degree. More envy, less envy. A person has a desire. If a person is totally cleansed of every inclination which borders on something wrong, what is that person? He's an angel. He's literally a living angel. Can't be you, but he's an angel. That was Moshe Rabbeinu. He had no relevance to the physicality. 
no inclination, wasn't inclined as much as an iota to anything physical. But a person is inclined, so I'm inclined to honor. You don't give me the honor. It may not disrupt my being, but I'll feel a, a tinge of something. You have something I don't have. Fleeting moment of envy. It may not even register, but there's a fleeting moment. So who's may riem zamzeh? Who brings harm upon one another? Only people have some level of commonality. Bavur shem tsoros tsruros meikuzezeh. They actually they detract. Avol Moshe, avol Reisi, es echomim. That's what he says. He said that I ever bring harm upon anybody, nobody, to any degree. Moshe lo shtatus misrov. These two things. I never took a donkey from them. I never brought any harm on them. But how's it possible? There's nobody that perfect. Moshe's get every Jew here. Did I ever bring harm on any Jew to any degree, even on the most infinitesimal level? People say definitely not. It's okay, but what does that mean? That means you're a malach. Moshe was a malach. Upirze borur gam pirashno also besefer beragoler. Upirush in sofik bo. This explanation is absolutely clear. It's not even in question. Let me share maybe different If you understand what truth is, this is the true understanding. You know, it's interesting. Just thinking, we find that this is the 40th year in the desert. We want to pass through the land, the territory of Edom. So Moshe gives us, gives, sends a letter to Edom that it says God sent His angel to take His people out of Egypt. Sholach Balocho. He's referring to himself. He, should, he, should, he sent me to take him out of Egypt. He sent His agent to send him in. Malocho. The answer he was Malocho. Moshe Rabbeinu was truly Malocho. He was God's angel. He happens to be a physical person. But just as an angel has no inclination only to do what God wants, that's exactly Moshe Rabbeinu. There's no inclination other than whatever his will is. Dad of Moshe Rabbeinu said, he struck the rock. He's inclined. If you take a look at, at whatever Moshe Rabbeinu failed, his failing had nothing to do with his physicality. It was always rooted in Chil Hashem. That behavior was unacceptable. After all God does, you have to what you speak. It wasn't a personal level. It wasn't on a personal level. Nothing to do with him. It was all an evaluation of because it was so inappropriate, you're not deserving. It's not because I want, I'm, I desire. His inclination was only for Hashem. Why did he fall? What was the pitfall of the Miragli? The spies come, they say, you know, we want to send scouts to spy the land. Moshe, he, Moshe should have vetoed it immediately. Whoever heard of such a thing? God says it's a land filled with uh, flows of milk and honey. You're questioning, you need spies. God just took you out of Egypt. He split the sea. You need spies. It's all a miracle. But they understood. They're very smart, the Jews. How do we somehow entrap Moshe Rabbeinu? That he should consider out what we our request. They said, you know, God promised us that we'll go with the, into Canaan. We're going to find houses filled with wealth, with goodness. He says, don't you think the Canaanites, they're going to bury their treasures? So what's going to be going to come? And we find empty houses. Jews will be disappointed. It's going to be a chil Hashem. Do you understand? So we're going to scout out the land to find out exactly where the treasures are. So when we come, we'll be able to locate the wealth. Moshe is the word chil Hashem immediately. He falls for it. He says, you know, it sounds, it sounds interesting. Let me, let me check with God. God says, if they want it, that's it. But he revealed to Moshe Rabbeinu what, where this was going to lead at the time. They didn't realize. But again, what, was, what, what, what caught him? What was the hook for Moshe? Chil Hashem. Whenever he got angry at them. Chil Hashem, this is unconscionable. After Hashem did all this for you, that's the way you behave. It's a disgrace. To have, but said it had nothing to do with his physicality. Of course, he was inclined to anything which has to do with, his, with being a human being. And my Rashid Zechariah the Rocha always used to mention it. Kuzari. Kuzari writes that the person 
even the Amoritz, the ignorant person who saw a prophet, we cannot fathom even that person. His dimension of greatness, his, his capacity, his scope of understanding. Could you imagine? An Amoritz who saw a Novi. You know what a Novi was? This is the, the Amoritz who saw the Novi. We're not talking about the prophet himself. We, we have no idea what a prophet is. You can read, well, God communicates with him. It's a dimension which we can't relate to. Can't relate to it. There's nothing this man doesn't encompass. And you know what he's compared to Moshe Rabbeinu? He was a speck. Moshe was the greatest prophet who ever lived. So, and here, what is their evaluation of Moshe Rabbeinu? He crossed the line. God forbid. Committed adultery. He has his eye on our wives. We have to forewarn our wives. They have to stay away from them. He's a man who can't be trusted. I never took a donkey. Lawyer Racy. How's it possible? You know, never heard a bad word out of his mouth. Nothing insulting. Never infringed on us. It says, Yirmiya Novi, Jeremiah, he had some semblance of prophecy to Moshe Ben. Of course, he wasn't Moshe. Volov Nemar. Novi Okum Nchomi Kirbecho Kamoni. I will establish a prophet from your midst similar to myself. This is Moshe Ben speaking. That means there's going to be another prophet similar to Moshe. Listen. But of course, it doesn't mean say face to face. Because the only prophet prophesied in wake state was Moshe. Zesnabi Memshon of Zesnabi Memshon. Moshe prophesied for 40 years. Yirmiyah Novi was a prophet for 40 years. It's a little bit difficult, the, number, the, the calculation. Moshe had an experience at the burning bush, right? He went to Egypt. The plagues themselves were 10 months. During this period of time, he prophesied the whole time by each one of the plagues. He prophesied before he came to Egypt. So minimally 11 months he was a prophet. Now he's in the desert for how many years? 40 years. So it was 41 years. Maybe it was 40 years and 11 months. So maybe because it's not a full year, we're counting as 40 years. No, no. No. Full 40 years, Moshe Rabbeinu was with the Jews. It's it's been 41 years. 41. So what do you mean? There, this one prophesied 40, he prophesied 40. Evidently, it was more than 40 years. Zesnabe, Yehud of Yisrael. Moshe Rabbeinu prophesied he came with all the Jewish people. There's no schism. Right? Later, there were two kingdoms. Zesnabe, Al Yehud of Yisrael. This prophecy had to do with Yehuda and Yisrael. The prophecy. The Kamet Vorim, Asher Shovim. We said many things they said are very similar. What Moshe said to Kalal Yisrael, what Yirmiya said to Kalal Yisrael. Moshe Mvur b'Medrash, the Fich of Omer Perk Bavakamo, Perk Bavakamo, Koroli Shucha. He says, Yirmiya said about himself, he says, they dug for me a pit. The Jews dug for me a pit. They wanted me to fall into the pit. So the Gemara said, what does it mean they dug for me a pit? Rabbi Lozo Meshe Choshdu Mizona. Hear this? Matthew, you're me the prophet. Does he know he goes to a prophet? He has a, a woman on the side. You're me. So we find the similarities. Call Yisrael suspected. God forbid. Moshe violated adultery. You're me. He has, he, has, he has a woman on the side. A zona. Prostitute. Rav Shmuel Omar. Choshdu Meshishish. Even worse than that. You're me. Commits adultery. You think he's so holy? Commits adultery. Don't be so holy than thou. Than thou. It's interesting. Yirmiya wrote with the author of Echor. He witnessed the destruction based on English. When he gave Musa to, to Kalal Yisrael, he rebuked him. He said, Rabbi, you think you see it straight, you see it backwards. With the tzaddikim, you're the bad one. 
So Yirmiya says, Omer Mala Or Choshech and Choshech Or. Is Yirmiya speaking? They're accusing him of adultery. Could you imagine? They're the adulterers. Why was the base of Mitch destroyed? Adultery. Murder and idolatry. Rabbi, you're an adulterer. Don't, don't, don't tell us what adultery. We do, it's okay. You, because it's consensual. You understand? What's going on over here? It's backwards. Asher Choshdu Me Shishish Ratzon Lama Shiyimi Is Dama Lamoshe We find a similarity to Moshe Rabbeinu. Shekamoshe Lo Hoye Moshe Odin Prati Miyuchad just Moshe Rabbeinu was not in, uh, an individual unto himself. He's not just a, a, an individual with a uniqueness. He had an, he encompassed. Just as Moshe's prophecy had relevance to every, to both camps, Yudah of Israel. His prophecy encompassed all Klal Yisrael. Another prophecy was to Yerushalayim, to Yehuda. What does he mean a prostitute for? Because one woman is not enough for him. He has to have his pick. And pick his, his pick. He doesn't have one woman who's compatible to him. Because one woman is not, there's no compatibility. As Moshe Rabbeinu, they, they suspected him. Except the difference is Moshe was, was the equivalent of Klal Yisrael. End here.